Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Fergus Randolph, and I'm performing two roles this afternoon. First is uh, as chair of the first panel, which will be looking at interchange fees and the application of Article 101. And uh, first, I have been asked to simply welcome you all. So welcome. I'm delighted you have been able to make the time to be here, particularly on such a nice uh, sunny uh, afternoon. However, I do hope that the contents of the panel discussions and indeed your input will be of assistance uh, to you. Um, on that point, I chair a number of panels uh, over, um, uh, over the year, and I always find it better if we can have input from the audience rather than just straightforward presentations from the panellists. So what I'm going to encourage, I talk to my panellists, and I assume that uh, the other panellists have done the same. I have talked to my panellists, and I uh, have asked them to ensure that we have a debate intra-panel, uh, and I hope that's going to happen with the second panel, but I'm also hopeful to have a debate between ourselves and yourselves. So... Um, do think of uh, questions for us, and I personally don't mind being interrupted. I'm pretty used to it in court. Um, you may want to, if you've got a burning question that you uh, think you want to put, then do so. Um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of this panel, because I'm not going to introduce uh, the next panel, in terms of this panel, uh, I am uh, delighted to have with me on uh, my right uh, Neil Dryden. Uh, at Compass Lexicon. Neil and I have known each other for a number of years, and he was uh, our expert uh, economist in the Arcadia litigation, uh, which, was, uh, which involved claims uh, made by a number of retailers against both MasterCard and Visa. And on my left, I'm delighted to have David Bailey from Chambers, who, as far as I'm aware, is not actively involved in interchange litigation, and which I think will be useful, because um, some of us that have been involved in interchange litigation over the years have maybe become too focused on the minutiae, and it's really useful to have a, a bird's eye view from someone such as David. So without further ado, um, I'd like to set this panel off. The plan is for um, us to make brief presentations for about 10 to 15 minutes each. I will give a, a, a very broad overview of the position in terms of the three first instance judgments, what they did, what they didn't do, and um, what the timelines were and where we are now. Neil will then uh, pick up the baton and talk more specifically about the MIT, the Merchant Indifference Test, and Roche and Tyrol, um, the <clears throat> theory that underpins that test. And then David will discuss uh, counterfactuals in the context of uh, this uh, litigation, this type of litigation. And then we're going to try and open it up. There are lots of issues that can be discussed. They're not just those two particular issues that our panelists are going to be dealing with. I'm going to be picking up a few points that you might like to think about whilst we're talking uh, before we open uh, the session up to the audience. So um, let me kick off. I would hope that most, if not all of you, uh, know that there are three first instance judgments at the moment uh, in relation to interchange claims. The first was uh, uh, a claim that was heard and decided by the CAT, and that was uh, a judgment handed down uh, on uh, the uh, 14th of July of uh, 2016, a 310 page judgment, something that's not uh, totally alien to the CAT to have long judgments, but you'll see in a moment how that is different from the commercial court. Because in the uh, Arcadia uh, claims against MasterCard, which were heard in between June and September of 2016, uh, Mr. Justice Popperwell's uh, judgment uh, was handed down. Uh, in 
uh, on the 30th of January of 2017, and that comprised a mere 137 pages. Uh, then, uh, finally, in this clutch of first instance decisions, we have Mr Justice Phillips, again in the Commercial Court, hearing the Arcadia and Sainsbury's claims against Visa this time, between November 2016 and February 2017, and this time a uh, rather emasculated 68-page judgment on 101.1, uh, was handed down on the 30th of November, and then a 21-page judgment was handed down on Article 1013 in February of 2018. So you, and I'll go into these judgments in a little bit more detail very briefly, but um, without spoiling uh, what I'm going to say, and as you probably know, uh, much of what was decided in those three judgments uh, was inconsistent with uh, the other judgments. And... Um, those three judgments were rolled up, everybody sought permission to appeal, and they were rolled up in a conjoined appeal that was heard about six weeks ago over uh, ten uh, days in the Court of Appeal, and we are, I think all of us in this room, are on tenterhooks uh, about what the result will be and how they'll do it. There are lots of words on the street about what will or won't happen, I'm not going to make the mistake of sharing those, the words I've heard on those particular streets, but maybe you want to uh, uh, share those uh, with me or with us. But in any event, it is awaited, and obviously that will be the next big stage in this litigation. What I can say is that I would put £5 on there being uh, a permission to appeal application to the Supreme Court by any... Uh, or all uh, losing parties. Uh, and then the interesting, fascinating point would be whether we could sneak in uh, and get a reference off to Luxembourg if there was such uh, permission granted uh, before the barriers, uh, the Brexit barriers came down. Anyway, that's, uh, that's, that's the position in terms of the timeline. In terms of the general points, as you'll see in a moment, all three claims were predicated on, in part, or in, in larger part, on the EC, the European Commission uh, infringement decision, but it wasn't, importantly, a follow-on action, or they weren't follow-on claims, very straightforwardly, because the claims concerned in large part the UK MIFs, and the Commission decision did not concern the UK MIFs, it only concerned the EEA MIFs. Insofar as the claims did concern the EEA MIFs, uh, essentially, the court uh, agreed, the courts agreed that they were bound by the decision taken by the Commission, which was to find that those myths had infringed Article 1011. All three judgments uh, diverged to a greater or lesser extent from the Commission decision. And this is something that is a sort of golden thread going through my presentation. I want to know why that is. There seems to be a willingness to put aside what the Commission has done and what has been upheld by the General Court and what has subsequently been upheld by the uh, Court of Justice. There seems a willingness to uh, plough uh, their own furrow, which is good in part and may uh, uh, show where we're going to go post-Brexit in terms of uh, competition uh, law and progress, but nonetheless we have this slightly weird position of three judgments that diverge quite materially from the uh, findings in the Commission decision, not least the fact that the MIFs did infringe uh, 1011. Um, and I think we need to investigate a bit more why that might be uh, the case. The Commission, probably because of that, was given permission to produce amicus submissions, both in writing and orally, in the Court of Appeal at this conjoined hearing, uh, which um, they have released at least part of those written submissions in terms of 1013, and I would imagine that the Court of Appeal will be assisted by what uh, they have to say. One of the points that you will see is of major relevance in these three judgments, and one which clearly caused 
the three sets of judges difficulty, major difficulty, and this is going to be something that occurs across all competition damages cases, is the issue of the counterfactual, identifying it and then applying it. And they got themselves into huge difficulty on that, unnecessarily, I would suggest, but this is a part and parcel of any competition damages case. You've got to have your kind of counterfactual sorted. And if the courts are finding that difficult, then one's got to ask, well, what can we do about that? And I'm going to come on to that at the end in terms of the appropriateness of, um, of the courts and which courts should, in fact, be dealing with these difficult types of uh, litigation. So in terms of the results, very quickly, uh, the CAT held that the MasterCard myths, this was the claim brought by Sainsbury's against MasterCard, held that the, Sains the, the myths, uh, the MasterCard myths that had to be paid by Sainsbury's were restrictive of competition by effect and that they weren't capable of exemption and that uh, accordingly um, Sainsbury's was awarded uh, the sum of just over £69 million pounds plus compound interest on 50% uh, of the overcharge, um, substantial sums indeed. That judgment came down, as I say, or was handed down on the 14th of July, which was smack bang in the middle of the MasterCard uh, case being heard by Mr Justice Popperwell, uh, being brought uh, by the Arcadia claimants. Mr Justice Popperwell found that the MasterCard myths that were paid by those retailers were prima facie restrictive of competition by effect, but in Australia that they were objectively necessary by virtue of the famous death uh, spiral, uh, this famous construct that had been put together cleverly by uh, MasterCard's lawyers uh, to suggest that uh, essentially if there were no myths uh, that could be uh, operated by uh, MasterCard and yet, in this magical world, they could be applied by Visa, then everybody would run off to Visa and there'd be no whoops, card scheme left for MasterCard to operate, and therefore the myths were necessary. We'll see what Mr Justice Phillips said about that in a moment. Um, what Mr Justice Popperwell said, went on to say is, OK, restrictive, prima facie, but objectively necessary, so not made out your case on 101.1, uh, but had you, you wouldn't have got through on... Um, on 101.3, in other words, MasterCard would have been able to show that they were exempt, so no claim, uh, no uh, payment out, no damages could be awarded, although this was a liability only trial. We hadn't got on to quantum. Mr Justice Phillips uh, then uh, heard uh, the case and Mr Justice Popperwell's judgment as per came out uh, during the course of that trial, and he found that the visa myths uh, were not restrictive of competition, that the uh, death spiral comprised, I quote, an absurdity, albeit that was put in brackets, but he said it, and that uh, had they been caught by uh, 1011, uh, they, would not, uh, they would not have been exempt pursuant to Article 1013. So very different from Popperwell. So no one very happy. In the counterfactuals, looking at this very quickly, the cat held that absent the myths, what you would have had, and don't let's forget the counterfactuals have to be realistic, what you would have had would be <coughs> voluntary ex-ante bilateral interchange fees being entered into by the respective uh, 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 banks. This is despite the fact that, as Mr Justice Popperwell remarked in his judgment, such a counterfactual, and I quote, formed no part of either Sainsbury's or MasterCard's case, but was a construct of the tribunal. So, no evidence before it really, from the parties in any event, about this counterfactual, but they said this was the appropriate realistic counterfactual on which to base itself, which led it to find that there was indeed a restriction of competition. Mr Justice Popperwell um, uh, didn't uh, take that approach. He said uh, that counterfactual uh, was incorrect and that the proper counterfactual was essentially that decided by the Commission. In other words, no myths with a prohibition on ex post pricing uh, or, he would say, a lower putatively lawful myth by reference to Article 1013. But as he went on to find, there wouldn't be such a putatively uh, lower lawful level.
Mr. Justice Phillips, in a rare, uh, a rare uh, case of agreement with Mr. Justice, Phil uh, Mr. Justice Popperwell, found that also the CAT counterfactual of ex-ante bilaterals was not appropriate and found that the appropriate counterfactual was indeed essentially settlement of par equating to a zero MIF. So very similar, if not the same, as uh, the position taken by Mr. Justice um, Popperwell. Given the fact, and I just throw this out, given the fact that you have two judges in the commercial court essentially on one point being pretty ad idem, finding a similar counterfactual, isn't it strange, I ask rhetorically, that they came to completely different views on their restriction of competition analysis? This was a restriction of competition uh, counterfactual, not an ancillary restraint counterfactual. So they came essentially to the same view on the restriction counterfactual, but then they put the sausage, sausage meat into the, into the machine, into the counterfactual machine, and boy, they got two different types of sausage. So that's interesting. I would suggest that maybe we want to discuss that in a little bit more detail later on. Briefly now, in terms of 101.3, and this I think is, is interesting in terms of burden and standard. So Mr. Justice Popperwell found that the burden of proving the overcharge lay on the claimants. And you can see the logic in that. Mr. Justice Phillips, on the other hand, said, no, 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 that's totally wrong. It lies on, in his case, Visa, the card scheme, on the basis, and he made that on the basis of general principles, uh, with which he was obviously very familiar, relating to proving facts going to the abatement or the avoidance of uh, liability in damages. So this is just general principles of uh, damages, proving damages in ordinary commercial cases. And he thought, actually, no, it's visa to prove that this overcharge uh, didn't uh, exist. In terms of the standard of proof, um, Ms. Justice Phillips' approach was strongly supported by the Commission. You've got to have robust and cogent evidence. Those are the words used. Um, Mr. Justice Popperwell's suggestions um, to the contrary were strongly criticised by the Commission and indeed uh, Mr. Justice Phillips. His approach was rather more... It's, crude to say finger up in the air, but he was happy to come to certain findings on the basis of more general assumptions. In terms of efficiencies, the first uh, uh, criterion, um, the Commission echoed Mr Justice Phillips' approach, which required net economic uh, benefits arising from the myths, and this is critical, from the myths, not from the card schemes as a whole, to be shown. And Mr Justice Phillips and I don't know whether they're talking to each other anymore after his judgment, but he described Ms. Justice Popperwell's approach to seeking to place a value on an individual efficiency <clears throat> by, and Ms. Justice Popperwell said, I'm going to do this by reference to the issuing bank's overall profit margin. Okay, that's quite a big, vague concept, and you're going to try and work out the value of one particular efficiency. What he said is this, I have no confidence that that type of exercise would produce anything approximating a true valuation of the alleged, allegedly pro-competitive effects across the whole of the UK and the real economy, it would be a remarkably unsatisfactory and surprising way of assessing whether an agreement at a particular level is unlawful under statute. So he obviously didn't agree with Mr Justice Popperwell. Um, the only thing that Mr Justice Popperwell can take away is the fact that in terms of the fair share criterion, the Commission in its uh, amicus submissions to the Court of Appeal agreed that essentially it was necessary to show a net compensatory effect on merchants, whereas Mr Justice Phillips has said you could have a situation where that criterion was met, even if the merchants as a whole, in terms of their class, uh, were not better off. So, remarkably contrasting, conflicting judgments. We have, in terms of football scores, I think on restriction of competition, you've got 1-1, one, one, loss 2. Death spiral, don't think the cat really went into this in any great detail, but 1-1, one, one, loss 1. Bilateral ex-ante ex uh, counterfactuals, that's definitely 1-1, one, one, <clears throat> and that wasn't on a tie break, I can tell you that, and loss 2 massively. And then exemption, 1-1, one, one, loss 2. The real question for me is... Um, how have we got here? How have we got to that position? Um, and it's fine in this room. We, we all know each other, and, and, and that's great, and we're all professional. Um, 
the, the problem is, from an outsider, if you were a Martian coming down here and looking at interchange fee litigation as one done, if one is a Martian after a long trip, you'd think, well, what's going on? We've got three different judgments taking totally different positions based essentially on the same principles, looking at the same infringement decision. What should we do? Well, maybe the answer is to go to the specialist tribunal, but then we've seen that the specialist tribunal has not covered itself in glory. Then there's the question of case management. Should we be allowed to have had three different cases heard at three different times by three different uh, judges and three different courts, and two of them in, in, in one, uh, uh, one jurisdiction, if you will, and, and, and one in the Competition Appeal Tribunal? Finally, there's the issue of the perfect storm. We have, obviously, Brexit, the uh, uncertainty in relation to competition litigation generally because of that. We have the lack of clarity from these three judgments, and we have the huge costs. I know for a fact, because I'm in air cargo, that we have, every time we have an air cargo hearing, we have our competitor litigators from other jurisdictions in the European Union coming to look, and sometimes to gloat, especially when Mr. Justice Peter Smith was dealing with the matter, uh, and to say, essentially, what on earth are these people doing in this jurisdiction? Why don't you guys come over and see us? I'm delighted to see on MLEX today that, in fact, a Dutch uh, set of claimants uh, uh, operating out of Schiphol have brought claims, I understand, in this jurisdiction, so that's jolly good. May there be many more, but I'm just saying I don't think we ought to be complacent, and I think we ought to be frank to try and get our house in order. Thank you very much. So I will pass on with that to Neil and then on to David. Um, thanks, Fergus. Um, so a vast amount could be said um, about the economics of interchange fees and how that economics has played into the Article 101 analysis. But in the very short time available, I'm going to focus on one aspect namely that the UK litigations have happened against perhaps quite an unusual backdrop in that the efficiencies at issue have been the subject of extensive published academic analysis, including a very important contribution by professors Rocher and Tyrol. Now, the Rocher and Tyrol analysis is informative about both the restriction of competition and efficiencies stages, but I will focus on the latter. And I'll briefly try to explain how that published academic analysis fed through into the UK litigations, uh, or unfortunately, how it didn't. So the starting point, uh, for those who are not familiar, is just to remind ourselves of what a multilateral interchange fee or a MIF uh, is. And that is that it's a fee agreed among acquiring banks those are the banks that provide card services to merchants and issuing banks, those that issue cards to consumers. And they're paid in the UK uh, from acquiring banks to the issuing banks. And thus, via pass-through, they result in a transfer from merchants on the right-hand side up here across to cardholders on the other side. So illustratively, we can think of an agreement taking place whereby 10p... Uh, illustrative number, will flow over from the acquiring side to the issuing side every time a card transaction takes place. Now, thinking about the efficiency justification for that myth, it was agreed among all the experts that an efficiency justification would require some sort of market failure, such as an externality, uh, and then the uh, idea being that the myth would create an efficiency by rectifying that market failure. And to see why that's the case, it's helpful to imagine, first of all, that there are no externalities. So then it's efficient on the left-hand side up here for cards to be issued by issuing banks to cardholders when, and only when, the cardholders value the cards by more than the issuer's costs of providing them. By contrast, there's only a need to subsidize via a transfer the issuing side if there is under-adoption of cards or under use of cards because the cardholders aren't taking into account the benefits that their card use confers on merchants on the other side. Uh, and Roshi and Tyrol identified an externality of exactly that type, which has become known in the UK litigations as the alignment benefit. And the idea is that when a customer like you or me goes into a shop and chooses between paying by cash or by card, he or she doesn't factor in 
the higher costs imposed on the merchant by choosing to pay by cash, such as all the cash handling costs and so forth. And the merchant is not in a position to steer the customer away from using cash because surcharging for cash would lead the merchant to lose a lot of business to other merchants. Uh, and I should say that whenever I refer to cash, I'm just using that as a general term for other payment means. So Roshi and Tarot showed that, and I emphasize this, under certain conditions, consumer surplus is maximized when the interchange fee flowing across is set equal to the merchant's savings from processing card uh, instead of cash. So if, for example, the merchant saves 10p every time the customer chooses to use ca ca um, uh, uh, ca uh, card rather than cash, it could generate an efficiency to set the MIF equal to 10p. And the issue, intuition for that, I think, is fairly obvious. Imagine a customer who's thinking of using cash, but only has a very slight preference for doing so. If the 10p flows across to the consumer, then it may induce him or her to use card instead of cash, and that creates an increase in the combined surplus for the consumer and the merchant, since the merchant makes the saving of 10p, so they're jointly better off. That's the efficiency. But Roshi and Troll's analysis contained uh, another insight, which is that the efficient level of the MIF changes potentially dramatically when the issuing bank banks on the left-hand left side there don't pass through the MIF completely to the cardholders. And that's going to be the case if some of the 10p <coughs> gets stuck in the issuing bank as profit or it's dissipated by the issuing banks as partly wasteful, socially wasteful advertising expenditure. Think of all the junk mail that you get encouraging you to take out credit cards. And here is uh, the critical point, in my opinion. Even when a very small amount of the MIF is not passed through, so even when, say, 1p out of the 10p gets stuck in the issuing bank or just wasted, this can mean that there is no level of the MIF, even a very low level of the MIF, that creates any efficiencies at all. And the logic of that is also, I think, quite intuitive. Suppose the MIF is 10p, and at that level there are 100 card transactions taking place. But suppose with no MIF, 90 of those transactions would have happened by card anyway. Then even if there's a small amount of incomplete pass-through of the MIF, from issuing banks to cardholders, say 1p and every 10p gets lost. That loss is happening over a very large number of transactions that are going to be occurring by card anyway, even with no MIF. And this leakage of the MIF, this leakage of the subsidy, this sort of dissipation of the transfer, which is a loss to consumer surplus, that leakage can outweigh the benefits that are created for merchants on the relatively small number of transactions that do actually switch from cash to card as intended and create the saving of 10p. So there's this, as soon as you have incomplete pass-through, there's a balancing exercise to be done. So just to re recap on Roshi and Tarol, they showed that when pass-through from the issuing banks to the cardholders is complete, the efficient level of the MIF equals the merchant's cost savings from card relative to cash, um, 10p in my example, but their model, when you get into the algebra, it doesn't jump out, but when you do the algebra, their model shows that the efficient level can collapse or even not exist at any positive level when there's even a small degree to which the MIF doesn't flow through to cardholders and when the number of transactions that would be happening by card, any, by card anyway is large. So all of this was agreed among the economists, I think, or at least it became agreed among the economists as the cases evolved. Um, but in saying there was agreement on that, I don't want to detract. There were vast numbers of disagreements on uh, other issues. But these core points, I think, are not controversial. Now let me very quickly pick up the story of how these Roshi and Tarol insights have influenced the assessment of MIFs in regulation and in the, and in the courts, <coughs> starting quickly with the European Commission and then the UK <coughs> litigations. So the Roche and Tarot model has in essence been adopted by the EC and it's driven their approach since around about 2010. So this led the Commission to uh, undertake work to estimate the level of the MIT, in other words, how much merchants save when uh, a card is used rather than cash. Those were the cost studies. 
But importantly, the EC has said that the answer to the 1013 question is not necessarily simply equal to the MIT, i.e. to that saving. The MIT is an input into the Article 1013 assessment. It is not the automatic answer to the Article 1013 assessment. And the, EE, and, the, and the Commission has said some time ago that in a mature card country, the MIF may not be justifiable within the 1013 rubric at any level, essentially for reasons including this incomplete pass-through point that I've made. So now I come to the three UK cases uh, extremely quickly, um, having probably just set a world record for sort of a Roshi into rural exposition, <laughs> so I hope it was somewhat comprehensible. Um, I come very quickly to the three UK cases and how they have been informed by those insights from that key article. And in my opinion, there have unfortunately been two fundamental errors among a number of other errors. And I'll call these two fundamental errors the naive rejection of the MIT and the naive acceptance of the MIT. So let me start with the naive rejection of the MIT. This is what happened in the first case at the CAT. That judgment makes no reference at all to the word externality. And that's really remarkable given that the whole, everybody, all the economists are agreed that any efficiency rationale for the MIF would have to rest on some sort of externality or market failure. That judgment contains no explanation of the Roche interval model or where the MIT, how the MIT is derived or where it comes from. That too is remarkable, in my opinion. What you do find in the CAT judgment is, having not explained what the model is or where it comes from, an express rejection of it, of the model. So quoting, the judgment, it says, quote, there are many problems with the MIT. There's then a very long list of all the problems with the MIT. And then there's the punchline, which I've read a hundred times, and it doesn't fail to surprise me on every rereading. Quote, that leads us to the most fundamental objection to the MIT, which is that it looks, and even then in, in an odd and indefensible way, to only one market, the acquiring market, the right-hand side. It ignores the fact that, the, that a MIF is a price in more than one market. So this is effectively saying that Tyrol, who is the, perhaps the leading academic, or one of the leading academics in two-sided markets, who won the Nobel Prize and who cited his work on interchange fee in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech, failed to spot that this was a two-sided market. And in devising the MIT, forgot entirely about the issuing side of the market. But the reason that the MIT doesn't depend on the issuing side is when you have complete pass-through, it's just a wash. As soon as you have incomplete pass-through, the issuing side matters fundamentally. And of course, the whole purpose is to internalize an externality between the two sides. So that was a bad outing for economists. Um, so now let me turn to the other error, which I will call naive adoption of the MIT. Um, and this, in my opinion, has been an error, if I may say so, on the part of the schemes and some of their economists. And that error was effectively to take the Roshi and Tyrol special case, that's when the efficient level of the MIF equals the MIT, and not engage at all in the assumptions required for that special result to actually apply in practice. So there were reports in these proceedings advancing the MIT before the courts that never even mentioned that the MIT result depended on complete pass-through on the left-hand side of this diagram, and never mentioned that the efficient level of the MIF would be radically different with incomplete pass-through and a high proportion of always card transactions. And I think that, too, is fairly remarkable, because I think it should be an economist's job to present and explain and lift the lid on these models, rather than just, as it were, advance the headline result from the executive summary, as it were. Um, I'll skip Popperwell and Phillips in the interest of time and just come to my conclusion, which is this was an unusual litigation because there was a very significant and potentially very helpful academic background, mm. but that's had decidedly mixed results when um, the rubber has hit the road. I don't raise the points that I do to attempt to refight the case or any of these points, but rather to try to make a general point, albeit I think an obvious one, which is economic analysis and models should be highly informative not just in this case, but in general to 101 free type analysis. But it's critical to do the spade work of asking how the model works, 
what the intuition is, what the assumptions are, whether the assumptions hold in practice, what are the implications if the assumptions don't, don't hold. And it was a failure to do that kind of spade work, in my opinion, that led both to the naive rejection mistake and to the naive acceptance mistake. I think these are motherhoods and apple pie propositions about how economics should be done, but for one reason or another, they seem to have got lost in these proceedings, and I think it's a contributory factor to the very divergent uh, judgments that we, that we see at the efficiency stage. Thank you very much indeed, Neil. David, shall we crack on, and then we'll have some time for questions. Thanks, Fergus. So I'm going to talk about <clears throat> the world that never actually ever happened, a sort of parallel universe, which turned out to be fundamental in each of the cases involving challenges to the MasterCard and Visa, Visa myths. I'm going to divide my um, remarks into sort of three parts. First, I'll talk conceptually, just a little bit about how lawyers and ideally judges would go about thinking and exploring a counterfactual, as I'd like to think about it, the but for world. Then talk secondly about the controversies that specifically arose in the interchange fee litigation, and then spend a bit of time thirdly on the conclusions that were reached by the various judges, as Fergus has said, that may have perhaps baffled a, a Martian looking down at it all. If I start then with um, a few remarks on, on concepts. I mean, the first point to note, of course, is that there is no single counterfactual that must always be used, and it may have to take its colour like a chameleon, depending on the, the issue in hand. And that was a point the Court of Justice made in, in MasterCard. I prepared a note just to accompany my remarks, and um, I, I've sort of set out a few authorities to sort of support uh, what I'm saying. And the second thing I wanted to say conceptually is that as, um, as Fergus has noted, it, the counterfactual has to be realistic. And when you're looking at effects, it also has to be likely. And, and those are pretty well established. But if you're really going to try and operationalize this whole idea, it seems to me really that you've got sort of three stages that have to be explored. The first stage in setting up a counterfactual is that you've got to make an assumption. You've got to take something away from the real world it's your but for point. And the real question is, well, what actually is it that I take away? What assumption do I make? As I put on my note, it's really but for what? And that's absolutely critical. And, and on that, the judges disagree with one another in terms of how they start to create. That, that's the assumption. Secondly, it seems to me, you have a factual exercise to undertake. Once you've made your assumption, you've created your but for world, you've then got to look as realistically as possible to see how competition would have evolved in that but for world. And that seems to me to be a, a, an exercise based on factual evidence that's available. When you've done that, thirdly, you reach a stage of evaluation or, or assessment where a judge has to decide for him or herself as to whether there would be more competition in that but for world than we actually observe in the real world. Now, it seems to me if you put those three things, an assumption, the factual evidence as to what would have happened, and then an evaluation, that sort of helps one to sort of think about or conceptualize counterfactuals. If I move to the controversies, at the moment you might get the impression that um, everyone disagreed about everything. Um, I'm not sure that's quite right. It seems to me that in terms of the starting point at least, actually the European Commission, the EU courts, the CAT and the commercial court judges did agree on at least two things when it came to the counterfactual. And it seems to me they're both very, very important. And the first of that is that when you're creating your but for world, you obviously have to remove the conduct complained about. So here that is a positive multilateral interchange fee. So that we remove. The other thing, critically, that we have to, um, everyone accepted, is that there will have to be some default provision that will allow card transactions to be settled. And the way the Commission dealt with that was to hypothesize a rule that actually, as far as I'm aware, never exists, is the idea of a prohibition on ex post pricing. I mean, they use the Latin. I mean, essentially what that means is that in order not to be at the mercy of um, issuers deducting whatever they like from a card payment, 
there would be a rule that says once the uh, card has been accepted by the merchant and is being processed, the issuers are not allowed to then seek to deduct from that sum. The CAT and the High Court judges, they said, well, I mean, that puts it beyond doubt, but you can deal with this hold-up problem simply under the scheme rules as they currently stand, that there would be a default provision, transactions would be settled at par, at face value. So, so far, actually, there's a degree of consensus. So where, then, do the controversies arise? Well, I think one of the distinctive aspects of this litigation is that do we have to go any further in creating our but for world in making an assumption about third party behaviour? Because, of course, in the MasterCard litigation, the sort of the elephant in the room was well, what do we assume, if anything, about Visa? And, of course, vice versa in the Visa case. And the answers that the judges gave to that question were different. At one end, you had the cat who said, well, look, we're just interested here in creating the but for world when we're looking at the MasterCard myth. So we're going to remove that. We're not going to make any assumptions about anything to do with Visa and if it would be constrained. On the contrary, the cat says, we will assume that they would do business as usual, they would be unconstrained, and there would therefore be a positive myth. Now, that's a crucial assumption for the cat to make, because that then is the basis upon which it then seeks to come up with uh, its voluntary bilateral counterfactual, which Fergus mentioned. What's interesting about Mr Justice Popperwell and Mr Justice Phillips is that they agree, however, that the cat's wrong about that, because you end up with a sort of circularity, that one scheme may be able to justify the other scheme um, if they're allowed unconstrained in the counterfactual to charge a positive myth. And they're only allowed to charge that myth precisely because the other would seek to compete with it, and you end up with a problem of logic and query a problem that essentially one, there's a sort of bootstrapping that takes place. The difference between the High Court judges was that one said, I'm not convinced from the evidence before me that actually the MasterCard scheme is materially identical to the Visa scheme. And so therefore, actually, Mr Justice Popplewell then says, well, if I haven't got the evidence, I can only do what the cat did and proceed on the basis that the Visa positive myths remain unconstrained. Mr Justice Phillips in Visa even though it didn't act, his decision didn't turn on this point, said, this asymmetric counterfactual makes no sense to me whatsoever. It's rewriting history. They're the same schemes with the same business model, with the same features. And so he um, simply said that you would have a symmetrical counterfactual. What that means is he would have made an assumption in creating the but for world that Visa and MasterCard would both be constrained by having to have no myth and a default rule settling at par. Now, the reason why that's so important is because once you've answered that question about the third-party behaviour, when you move to my second stage about the factual assessment of what would have happened, and it seems to me that does have to be as realistic as possible, it's point eight in my note, you then do end up with some rather different views on what the world would look like. The Commission thought there would be a short period of bilateral negotiations, but actually what would happen is the merchants would exercise some pressure on the acquirers, there would be a temporary bit of competition, but basically in the long term you would go to default and settle at par. Fergus has mentioned the cat disagreed with that and said, well, actually, no, you'd get donations made by the uh, merchants because what would happen is that they would have an interest in paying more than zero in order to keep the MasterCard scheme alive. Why? Because they had an interest in trying to avoid issuers simply up sticks and going to Visa to try and get the myths. And you can see when the cat makes that analysis, crucial is... Number one, that Visa continues unconstrained with its positive myths. And number two, although the parties, although the factual witnesses, although the experts, and note their name, experts, all said that it would not be plausible for acquirers and merchants to go and strike bilateral deals, the CAT created it on its own.
And we can come on to why it did that, perhaps um, later on in, in discussion. Neither Mr Justice Popwell nor Mr Justice Phillips agreed with that. Ferguson already dealt with it, really. What I find interesting is that Mr Justice Popwell did accept this rather colourful idea of a death spiral, basically saying, well, because I don't think there would be bilaterals, and because I think that Visa would have a positive myth, then like with the Maestro example, essentially issuers would follow the money. And so they would leave the MasterCard scheme to get more revenues from Visa, and that brings about the fact that MasterCard wouldn't survive. If it wouldn't survive, there isn't any competition to restrict, and then there's no infringement. Mr Justice Phillips doesn't agree with any of that, because as I said already, doesn't believe that you should have an asymmetric counterfactual. But what I find very interesting about his judgment is unlike the Commission and unlike the other courts, he agrees with the visa submission that actually the only thing you're arguing about is the level of the price, whether the myth is 10 or whether the myth is naught or whether the myth is minus 10. And if you're really only arguing about the level of the price, as the Court of Justice said in the MasterCard case, that in and of itself is not a restriction of competition. To put the uh, conclusion in a different way, Mr Justice Phillips is saying at the evaluation stage there's no more competition in the counterfactual than there would be in the real world, therefore there's no restriction of competition. If I just move then um, finally to sort of, well, why do we end up in this place? How can I advise, not that I advise Martians, but how can I advise a Martian as to where we got to in this, in this, uh, in this scenario? It seems to me that there are a number of factors at play. The first is you can never rule out judicial creativity. Um, the tribunal went out of its way to criticize the, uh, the economists and said we didn't derive much assistance from them because in the tribunal's view, the economists had been given rigid instructions on the law, which had affected the opinions they gave. And moreover, apparently, the economists were not on top of the thousands of pages of factual material. They weren't experts on payment systems, ergo they therefore should be dismissed. Query whether the same points, maybe not on the law, but on the, or certainly on payment systems, could be said of the judges themselves. They appear to have come up with their own construct. And, and there's, there's clearly a, a, an issue there in terms of its plausibility. The, the second thing I would say about the counterfactuals is that um, it does depend quite radically on the assumptions that are being made. And there is a clear difference between how Mr Justice Popperwell saw it in the MasterCard litigation, where he sort of recognised that there would be a, a legal and logical problem if the MasterCard scheme could be justified by the Visa scheme and vice versa, but he saw it in terms of, but actually you haven't proven it to me as a matter of fact, whereas Mr Justice Phillips seemed to just simply accept that no, that, that sort of but-for world must have to constrain Visa and MasterCard, um, otherwise it wouldn't make any sense. It seems to me that when you're looking at counterfactuals, therefore, you, what you've really got is a mixed question of law, of fact, and of opinion. It's of law because there has to be some framework about it being realistic, and when you're looking at effects, it has to be likely. It's a fact because although it's called counterfactual and it sort of sometimes leads you into sort of thinking about parallel universes, really all you're doing is, is a but-for test. You're removing the conduct complained and you're trying to work out as a matter of fact how um, the market would evolve. And of course, you can never escape from opinion in terms of reaching a judgment on, on the competitive process. I had wondered, well, what happens if you're talking about counterfactuals? Well, what would be the alternative? What would, what would actually happen? It seems to me there are only really two alternatives if you wanted to get away from this exercise. One would be to have no counterfactual at all, but then it seems to me you don't have any way, any analytical tool by which to work out if competition has been restricted. So I reject that. An alternative might also be to have a presumption of some kind. But really, that's what the work of restrictions by object is doing. It uses an inference. And I don't see how a presumption can reflect the factual matrix that's going on in these or other cases.
My final thought then on counterfactuals is this. It's very easy, um, if you like competition law and you like myths, that you get all kind of um, obsessed by it all. Actually, counterfactuals aren't unique to myths. They occur in many competition cases. But maybe the bigger point is they're not even unique to competition law. There are various other cases in the commercial world, if you're looking at the effects of um, an accountant giving negligent advice, or a Frankovich damages claim being brought against the government, which occurred in the High Court, where exactly the same issue arises. And so I'd sort of use that. Um, and it even arises in Hollywood. If you think of the Sliding Doors movie, that's a whole thing about counterfactuals, the way I explained it to my wife as to what I was doing today. I just said, I'm talking <laughs> about sliding doors. And she's like, oh, lovely there. Yeah. Um, but I, mean, I think when you have that in mind, it's really helpful because it means you can sort of use those established principles to work out the assumption, to look at the facts, and then reach a few. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, David. Um, we have... 20 minutes, I think, uh, mm -hmm. before tea or coffee. Um, I just have a couple of, couple of questions. I know that you're all bursting to ask yours. I can see hands popping up as I speak. Not, but I'm sure they will in a moment. Um, question for Neil. Since you ended up saying, look, this was where we are is due in part, not in whole, due in part to the manner in which the economic evidence was dealt with, and um, by the people who were dealing with it, in other words, the economic uh, experts. What could have been done more differently to avert or lessen uh, the problems that arose? And would any solution include having, certainly for, in terms of the commercial court cases, an expert economist on the panel or on the bench, with, which is possible under the rules? Would that have assisted? Um, one thing I think that's worth saying just before I sort of try to grapple with the question um, is that in the joint expert meetings, I think the, the economists, and there are quite a few of us involved in the end, um, we by and large agreed on a lot of the economics. Mm -hmm. And kind of wedges were driven between economists, or economists had incentives to drive wedges between themselves, um, by sort of answering different questions or making different assumptions about what the legal framework was. So yeah. for example, you know, just to take an example, the fair share limb of Article 101.3, um, you know, different economists reached different answers about the implications of that, but it was the, because the, they started from a different premise about you know, fair share to whom. Um, so you know, I think it would be a mistake uh, to s sort of go away from what I said to think that you know, economics is a, dismal so is a dismal science because economists can't agree on anything. I think the, the litigation process has a tendency to create and magnify differences. Um, and then that's a long-winded sort of beginning to answering your question, which is obviously mechanisms that somehow control that um, are going to be good ones. Uh, I have no idea. I, I don't really know if, uh, if, a, if a sort of um, court expert would have assisted. I find, I find that quite hard to answer. Um, two observations. One is there was not a hot tub, mm. and I wonder if that could have assisted. Yeah. Um, um, because I, yeah, I think that could have assisted. The other was that the court, uh, you know, there were questions for experts. Um, one thing that I found truly remarkable is that I thought that as a sort of good boy, what you're meant to do is answer the questions for experts. So I wrote a report and then w said, okay, and actually, and there was a long list, you know, 20 or 25 mm -hmm. questions when you multiplied them out across the different, went through them one by one and said, okay, so this is my precise answer to each of these questions related back to my analysis. Uh, other experts didn't answer, literally didn't answer the questions for experts. And I found it remarkable they were never held to, to, to that mm. task that had been set. Mm -hmm. um, so I think my short answer is, um, I think qu having questions for experts is a good idea. 
they, that could force the economists to answer the questions from this, on the same legal mm. assumptions mm. rather than having different answers because people are assuming different things. Mm. That only works if, if economists are held mm. to the task of answering the questions uh, uh, rather than just ignoring them. Um, you know, and I wonder if maybe a hot tub could have helped. That's interesting. Thank you for that. And a quick question for David. I totally agree with you in terms of uh, counterfactuals being a but-for exercise. It's obvious um, and it's necessary. As you point out, commercial courts up and down the land, county courts, civil courts across this jurisdiction and indeed in other jurisdictions deal with but-for matters day in, day out. Why does it, and, and there are no big problems, and Mr. Justice Phillips' approach of saying, well, it's obvious, isn't it? These schemes are materially the same. I didn't have pound shillings and pence evidence on it. I didn't have, um, but, but nonetheless, it's clearly obvious that they are similar, and therefore you can't have an asymmetrical counterfactual. Why? And, and that is an approach that is often taken by courts uh, dealing with but-for questions outside of competition law, just general, uh, based on you know, reality. W why did it prove, do you think, so difficult in this case um, for there to be uh, an easy assumption of their task in carrying out the but-for analysis, given the fact that they do it day in, day out? Was it because it was clothed in this rather... Uh, exotic plumage of counterfactuals, which everybody thinks are something special, or was it because it simply wasn't explained uh, sufficiently well to the courts? I'm not sure I'm in a position to comment on whether it was explained well or not, but I mean, what I would say is that the, the legal position on what assumption, if any, one makes in relation to the conduct of a third party is not clear. The European Commission and the EU courts don't begin to even grapple with the question in the MasterCard case about visas' behaviour. In fact, if anything, the uh, position appears to be that it is irrelevant. You sort of see that in the Visa 2 case right the way back in 2002. You see it more recently in Carte Blanquere in the General Court. They sort of say that actually the impact on the competitiveness between payment systems it's a one on one three issue, and it sort of seems to be the approach. And so, therefore, the, the, the precedents, at least at an EU level, sidestep the question. So, I think that's partly why it is difficult, because no one, as far as I'm aware, could point to any jurisprudence as a matter of competition law and say, this is how it should be done. You could use lines of argument in terms of logic, you could use points about circularity. But it doesn't seem to me that that would necessarily resolve the issue. Um, I think more broadly, there was a case in front of Mrs. Justice Rose. It's not a competition case. It was brought against the UK government, um, uh, Secretary of State for uh, Media, Culture and Other Good Things. Um, and it was brought by a telecoms operator seeking damages against the state. And the telecoms operator wanted to basically make cheap calls to mobile. In order to do that, it needed access to SIM cards made by mobile phone operators. And the reason for mentioning it is because it gives rise to exactly the same conundrum that arose in the interchange fee litigation, albeit very, very different facts, because the judge had to work out when the government was the defendant, whether it had transposed EU law correctly, you had the claimant that was the telecoms operator of a bright idea, but there was a third party, the mobile network operators. And so the question was, would the mobile network operators, would they actually agree to supply SIM cards to the claimant? Now the claimant said, well, they'd have to. Why? Because they say competition law would force them to, because otherwise it'd be an abuse of a dominant position. Mr. Justice Rose said, well, I'm not sure that's right, actually, because there is not the question about how should the mobile phone companies have behaved. That's not the question at all. It's a factual question about how would they have behaved. So she looked at the commercial position of the mobile phone company, looked at the relative bargaining position of the mobile phone company and the internal documents that were available to her, and said, well, what would the risk be? How would a mobile phone operator, in terms of competition risk, how would it deal with that risk? Would it supply some cards, all cards? And she reached a view. 
Um, it's a really interesting judgment because she also addresses, when it comes to quantum, which we haven't really discussed no. today, but when it comes to quantum, again, the counterfactual looms large. And in that case, the government submitted to the judge that, well, look, it's also incredibly difficult and there are so many variables, we should just award nominal damages. And she rejects that submission and says, well, look, just because it's hard doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Mm. And so she sort of says, well, the, the but for world has to be a pragmatic. The judge does the best as he or she can exactly. on the evidence available. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and it seems to me that each of the tribunal and the commercial court judges were trying to do that. It's an unusual situation where we normally cannot predict the past because when the court says what happened, you can't gainsay that. Here we have a natural experiment where we've got three courts considering broadly similar issues, exactly. reaching different conclusions exactly. about what would have happened. And so I suppose the most interesting thing will be to read what the Court of Appeals says, because yeah, exactly. it has the benefit of that. It can then try and work out what is the most convincing. Yes, and I, I thank you very much, David. And I think, as I said earlier, that the... Court of Appeal is obviously going to be um, going to be important, and I'm going to break uh, my promise about not sharing one of the words on the street. Uh, but it's it's a well-known word, so I'm not I'm not uh, breaching anybody's confidence. Um, apparently, uh, there might be a, a possibility of a remittal of part of the um, part of the uh, case back to a tribunal, and it would probably well, it would have to be a differently constituted tribunal, and one would assume it would be the Competition Appeal Tribunal. But anyway, that, that is certainly one word on the street. We would have to see, because if they want to work out actual figures, then the Court of Appeal, I would imagine, wouldn't be best placed or want to really get involved in that, but I may be entirely wrong, um, but anyway, I thought I'd share that.